Dear listeners, a very good evening and welcome back to Friday Night Fusion, the new sound of Great Britain broadcasting live and interactive on 93.5 FM, Unity FM across Birmingham and surrounding areas both nationally and internationally on www.unityfm.net and a very warm welcome to our sister station 105.1 Inspire FM who are also picking up our feed this evening. Now, cricket. It is a well-loved passion of uh, many of us, especially here in the Asian community, the Arab community as well, do take quite a big interest. But what is the future of cricket, specifically the Champions Trophy? Many of you have been writing in to us in the past few weeks talking about how you will miss the Champions Trophy when it is due to leave in 2020. 13. However, what legacy will it leave behind? Will its replacement actually be just as exciting, just as interesting to watch? Well, let's find out. Joining me on the line, I have Mr. Steve Elworthy, who is the uh, tournament director at uh, the ICC. Hello, Steve. Thank you very much for joining us on Friday Night Fusion today. No worries at all. Good to join you, Ahmed. Very good. Now, what makes the ICC Champions Trophy different to the World Cup? Well, the only difference really is the, is the number of teams. Um, I think the current World Cup, which is the, the next, we've just seen the one in India a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago. Now, the, the, the next one in, um, uh, in Australia in 2015 is basically the number of sides that participate. Mm. Um, it, the Champions Trophy is a shorter version of that. It's your top eight one-day international sides right. that play in the competition. Mm. Um, and that then allows you to play the competition in a shorter period of time, which is over a three-week period in 2013. You know, it's in June next year. So uh, starts on the 6th of June and finishes on the 23rd. So you can see that in that period of time, you've got your top eight sides. It's 15 matches, and it's played in a three-week period over 18-odd days. Um, but it will reflect... Uh, if you look at the, the way that it's penciled in right now, the 2019 Cricket World Cup, which is going to be hosted here in the UK as well, mm. um, that is that is penciled in to be a 10-team event. Right. So pretty close to where they are. There's obviously qualification, and teams will have to go through a qualification phase. Sure. But the Champions Trophy is very close mm. to what that Cricket World Cup will look like in 2019 at the next round. Yeah. And does that tournament structure actually guarantee an exciting few games, an exciting tournament, would you say, in your opinion? Yeah, I think absolutely. You know, if you think about it, those top eight sides uh, in the world, uh, we're having a debate the other day about it. You know, you've got you know, India, who the uh, the current World Cup holders. You've got South Africa, who are test champs, number one in the world there. You've got the West Indies, who've just won the World 2020 in Sri Lanka. Um, England are playing some great one-day cricket, mm. as we've seen. Sure. Um, and all the other sides that are always involved there with the likes of Pakistan and Sri Lanka and New Zealand, Australia are playing some fantastic I don't know you could pick a winner um, so you've really got the 10 so you've got the 8 top sides playing here plus you've got all their, their top stars playing so they, the, the structure of the tournament is 2 pools of 4 so right. um, that is then they split up. So they play three round robin games each, mm. and then it goes straight into semi final and straight into final. So yes. when you're playing big nations of the top eight nations in the world, when you're playing in those group games, every single game means something. So I think the pressure and intensity of those games mm. um, is really going to sell the tournament and the quality sure. of that cricket. Um, and as we've seen, I think the, the most exciting thing is that all of these teams are really playing some fantastic Absolutely. cricket right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's going to really drive the mm, tournament for mm, us. Mm. Now, one day international cricket has been going for a while now. Do you think it still proves to be attractive to the public? I think it's still probably the most popular format of the game. I would say probably globally, really. Um, if you look at attendances around the world, I know there's there's bits and pieces happening around test cricket, as we've seen. Uh, it's still, obviously, from a player's point of view and from an administration point of view, still the pinnacle of the game, test cricket, and everybody strives for that. I think it's yes. uh, it really is the, the top format of the game. But mm -hmm. one-day cricket is a fantastic day out. And I think specifically here in the UK, we've seen attendances across the last 
six to eight years, uh, as far back as, as sort of reliable attendance data comes out, that we're upwards of 90, 95% attendance across all One Day Internationals hosted wow. in this country. So, Fantastic. you know, if you th- if you think about that, you think about how it's attended in other countries around the world, and we see those packed stadiums. Uh, ultimately it's the spectator who decides the popularity and they're still coming in their droves mm, mm. so you know i think this is the the champions trophy here if you're talking about legacy for us the legacy is really driving what one day cricket is all about and then making sure that people are inspired and you're looking not so far down it sounds a long way 2019 but the cricket world cup in 2019 you know so uh, yeah. absolutely still very very popular Mm -hmm. As you know, economically, times are quite hard at the moment. People are feeling the pinch, watching the pennies. How much are the tickets going to cost? And do you think that you'll have any empty stands this time? Well, I think that from a tournament point of view, obviously, you know, aspirationally, you'd love every single game to be sold out. You know, we'd love to see full stadiums. The players love playing in front of them as well. Um, But, you know, I think what we've done is we've sat sat with the venues and worked up a ticket pricing strategy, which I think is really going to go a long way to helping achieve that goal. Um, you know, it is about making sure that the stadiums are full and the, it's vibrant and there's a lot of atmosphere there. It's, you know, um, if you look at the prices we've got, we've got an under-16 ticket price across the entire tournament of £5. Pounds. Wow. Um, and then we've introduced an under-21 price because we felt that there was a big jump from under-16 to an adult price. Um, paying a fiver to moving up to then what an adult ticket was and we know that there are uh, you think of the three venues around um, Edgbaston and around the Oval and Cardiff they're big student populations and we really want to attract young people to get in and get involved with the sport and get involved in cricket so we've introduced the under 21 price Mm. um, which for the group games is only 10 pounds so um, that's for all under 21s. Uh, the semi finals, it's 20. But I think the biggest thing is if you look at from a, a family point of view, um, for a group game, a family of four can come to a one day international, as we've heard, the quality of the cricket and the players that are going to be there for 50 pounds. Mm. You know, the adult prices are 20 tickets and then 20 pounds. And then the, um, the juniors, if you've got two kids with you, it's a fiver. So for 50 quid, we, you know, you can come and watch a group game um, of some of the highest quality. So we think that's going to go a long way in helping mm. um, uh, fill these stadiums. Fantastic, because obviously if you look back to a lot of games and a lot of other sports, you pay £50 per ticket, don't you? So for an entire family to have the opportunity to go and watch some good cricket and have a great day out for only 50 quid, it's a bargain they can't refuse. Yeah, I agree. You know, you think of some of the games and if you look specifically up and around at at Edgbaston, you know, you've got England are playing Australia there. Um, You've got Pakistan are playing South Africa. Australia are playing New Zealand, and you've got India playing Pakistan. They've also got the final, you know, around uh, up at Edgbaston. So, you know, if you think about it from their point of view, they've got some, they've got some fantastic games, and we would hope very well supported. Yes, absolutely. Now, a lot of our listeners are impatiently waiting and shouting at the radio right now. <laughs> I can see them in front of me, and they want to know, Steve, when do those tickets go on sale so they can grab them? They go on sale on Monday, half past 10, 5th of November. So it's, uh, it's not far away, a couple of days away. Um, it'll be open to, uh, to, to general public, and uh, we're gearing up for that right now. Um, obviously, the venues have got their, their normal membership uh, database, and their season ticket holders and members yes. who uh, have the opportunity this weekend to uh, to secure their memberships and their tickets. Um, but then it goes on general public sale at half past 10 on, uh, on Monday, yeah, on Brilliant. the 5th of November. We've had a lot of emails coming through here on Friday Night Fusion, Steve. A lot of people saying they're going to miss the Champions Trophy when it goes. What do you think will be the impact of the Champions Trophy on the city of Birmingham? Actually, the wider region, the West Midlands and the Midlands as a whole. Well, you know, we I was at a, I attended a, um, uh, a media launch with uh, Colin Povey, uh, chief executive of uh, of Warwickshire County Cricket Club in Edgbaston, uh, last week. You know, and it he alluded to the fact and what it's going to do for Birmingham in terms of uh, numbers and uh, uh, and from an economic point of view. You know, the numbers of people that will be travelling in, um, the global television audience. 
uh, the radio reach around what uh, a, a, around the matches themselves is going to be fantastic for the venue, you know. And I just think it really will it really will highlight the the new development there. It'll highlight the city. Um, if people will see it globally, um, you know, you think of those sides that are playing there. Um, the, the profile it's going to cause and the profile it's going to generate is going to be absolutely fantastic. What we hoping and what we trying to in, everything we're doing is to engage with the communities you know yes it's all good and well that the um uh, you get this global audience and people will be able to watch the matches and they'll see that at Birmingham putting on it. But w- w- the ultimate drive is really, as we spoke about early legacy, we want people mm-hmm. engaged. We want people engaged with cricket. Yes. We want them playing the game. Sure. Um, we want them attending. We want them supporting cricket. And I think that, you know, it's healthy. 2013, we've got no other. Yes, it's an Ashes year. It's a fa- it's a, it's a big year for cricket mm. but it doesn't have anything competing with it on a global stage there's no olympics there's no football world cups cricket True. is a, is standalone mm. and we really need to drive that next year and make sure people we want them engaged and we want them playing um ultimately that's that that'll be that'll be success for me at the end of it you talk about engagement and of course one of the most important things for you to do is to engage with us Brummies and Birmingham prides itself on being a very multicultural rich city. How will you ensure that all people from all cultures are engaged and actually do come down to the games, not only for the sake of watching a bit of great cricket but also to become inspired perhaps to play a bit of cricket themselves? I think that's a long-term plan that we're working with very closely with with Edgbaston themselves. You know, I think they've got um, they've been in and around obviously Birmingham for a very long time, and they've got relationships with their communities. I think what we're trying to do by bringing the global event and the, the having hosting the global event there is really enhance that. Um, you know, you've got eight nations competing in this tournament. You've got obviously eight different population groups that are going to be following their teams. And we will be speaking to each of those nations. Um, I think we're getting really targeted in making sure that we speak to the right pop- the right people, following the right teams, um, and getting the right messages across to them, and understanding um, what their needs are. You know, I think you've got to understand that it's not just about coming to watch the the fixture and then um, and then we're not going to speak to you again. I think mm-hmm. that's the that to us is the is the real, as I said, the success from a legacy point of view, sure. that we want to keep you engaged, we want you playing, um, whether it be school cricket or club cricket, uh, even if it's just recreational cricket down at the mm. park, we want people picking up bats and balls and playing. Sure. Um, and to us, that's the success. And that, you know, the engagement goes further than just this tournament. We've got bilateral series that are going to be hosted in the UK um, for the next 15, 20 years, you know, the Future Tours program is, is, is embedded and in place. So when, for example, India come in 2014, um, we want to be able to speak to the people who supported the Champs Trophy in 2013, mm. that they're engaged in 2014. And, you know, moving on to the, the following year, that whether it be a, a Sri Lanka, a Pakistan, an Australia, whoever they happen to be, that they're engaged with those bilateral series. And I think we need to just build on the bigger great news story that cricket is all about and really drives people playing now a lot of sports out there particularly football i suppose its critics argue that actually you have a lot of grassroots footballers that perhaps don't make it into the mainstream teams what sort of work is going on here in the uk and i suppose internationally as well to ensure that the grassroots talent from countries like england pakistan india australia of course a very well known and very successful team what sort of work is going on steve to ensure that the grassroots talent can have the opportunity to someday play up there with your uh, top players yeah, it's a it's obviously a very key point and uh, a very key element to the success of 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 any national team. You know, I think the more people you've got playing down the bottom um, of the of the tree, getting in, inspiring young people to play at that grassroots level, the more opportunity they've got to obviously playing playing for their country. And I, as I said, I, you know, that's not necessarily the be all and end all. Yes, it's it'll be fantastic for those players to to ultimately one day represent present their country mm. but you know i think there's you know, i'm part of a club in in london here that is that that it's fantastic to see and they people are 
unbelievably engaged just at a local level, whether it be playing in the fourth team or the fifth team right. or the second or third team. You know, yes. they understand that's their level and they are completely mm. passionate mm. about the game. Mm. And I think that's the that's what we try to do. There, there are programs in place. We've got people at the England Wales Cricket Board whose job it is to make sure we call it whether it's inspiring the nation to choose cricket or yes. and, and how we get how we engage with them. You know, chance to shine, do some fantastic work with us in the ECB um, in getting into, into schools and making sure that uh, there's opportunity for, for, for kids to play. Yes. Um, and that's across the board. That's right down, you know, from, from younger age group, there's this pathway for them, whether it be through schools, whether it be through clubs, into universities, and then further on down the line, you know. But uh, it, it's about getting them playing. Not necessarily, yes, it would be fantastic. You get a few more playing for, for England, but, uh, you know, I think it, it's the broader mm. health of getting people playing lifestyle Sure. getting them playing cricket and that to us is vitally important absolutely and uh, obviously talking about youngsters here we're very lucky to have clubs like uh, Edgebaston and cricket grounds like Edgebaston very close to home that we can visit on a regular basis and uh, be able to go to those games now thanks to the wonderful ticket prices that you mentioned earlier and talking about Edgebaston interestingly enough I believe that they are actually hosting their first ever major international cricket final how important is this development I think it's very important for them. You know, I think um, we, if you if you have a look around, I think we, from in, from England and Wales perspective, I think we we're pretty blessed in terms of um, stadiums and venues we have that could host international matches. Um, any one of the the major test playing venues would be able to to host this, I think. But I think what this has done from an Edgbaston point of view is really shown and highlights. Um, the, the, the commitment to the investment they've made to to building the, the fantastic facility that they've got and regarded now that stand at the at the far end is is regarded as one of the best in in world cricket. Mm. Um, so you know I think facilities infrastructure are all vital um, and it really does you know hosting a successful event for them will absolutely put them on the map and I think these it, it's a it goes a long way to to congratulating for the the hard work they've done and the massive effort they've put in to get it to where the, where it is now we've seen some fantastic finishes there I remember ashes matches and all sorts of things going on and some incredible finishes for our finals day 2020 finals day mm-hmm. um, you know they, it's a it's a wonderful venue venue and I think a, a lot of kudos needs to go to them. Sure, so it's all happening uh, very, very soon, right here in Birmingham, in our own city at our very own Edgebaston Cricket Ground. The tickets are absolute bargains to put it quite clearly to our listeners. It's certainly something that nobody should miss out on. Just remind us again, Steve, when do the tickets go on sale and how can people grab those tickets to uh, see the uh, Champions Trophy final here at Edgebaston? Well, they go on sale on uh, on Monday, the 5th of November, uh, 2012, and uh, that's from 1030 they can get their tickets if they they, they visit the icc-cricket.com website um, or there's even a phone number that they can call which is uh, 0844-249-2013. Um, so, you know, as of Monday morning, 10.30, they'll be up and running and uh, we're hoping to, hoping to receive their calls and or chat to them on, online. Absolutely brilliant. Well, my producer Taz is uh, jumping up for joy there. I'm sure he'll be on that phone at 10.30 on Monday. Let's uh, hope that many of our listeners follow suit. Steve Elworthy from the ICC, thank you very much for joining us on Friday Night Fusion this evening. And uh, best of luck with the uh, final champion uh, trophy event that you've got taking place at Edgebaston. Brilliant. Very good speaking to you. Thanks for the time.